part three of On Landings, we'll take a look at a variety of landing situations that continue to create problems for pilots. They are gear up landings, landing gear emergencies, landing on wet, icy, or snow-covered runways, and last, the hazards of landing at night. We'll then wrap up with a brief discussion about the importance of your decision-making process, the so-called human element in flying. We'll start with a discussion of ways to avoid gear-up landings. Retracting the landing gear was a great step forward in getting more cruise performance and efficiency from airplanes. There was only one problem. Pilots sometimes couldn't or wouldn't put the landing gear down. And other times the gear was pulled up on the ground, making the pilot look and feel rather foolish. In attempts to avoid such foolishness, gear warning lights, horns, buzzers, and other devices were designed. One inventor even developed a system where a boxing glove actually came out of the panel and hit the pilot if he didn't put the gear down before he pulled the power back to idle. Fortunately, this idea never caught on. If it had, canny pilots would probably have carried higher power settings with full flaps and still managed to land gear up without getting hit by the glove. <laughs> Just socked with the bill. When horns were used for warnings, pilots used the excuse that the noise was so distracting that they forgot to put the gear down. Accident investigators didn't buy these explanations, although the pilots usually received high marks from sideline judges for their originality and imagination. Would you believe some pilots even mistook the gear warning horn for the stall warning horn and were thrilled at the nice slow approach that they made all the way to a gearless touchdown? In other accident reports, pilots swore that they heard the outer marker horn blaring all the way to the point of touchdown, which makes for an awfully wide outer marker cone. Then, of course, there's the CB, or Circuit Breaker Club. Those are the guys who've gone off on training flights to practice emergency gear extension procedures and pulled the landing gear circuit breaker, only to forget to put it back in again. And there have actually been cases when pilots cleverly used their gear for speed brakes to slow them down, extending the gear at altitude to increase drag, then when they got to the point in the pattern where they usually extend the gear, they'd reach down to the gear handle again, not thinking anything about the fact that they were moving it up. And of course, you guessed it, they landed in a very short distance. You know, one thing that gear up landings all have in common, and that is that 999 out of 1,000 pilots say exactly the same thing at the moment of touchdown. The only way to prevent most gear-up accidents is to establish a routine, a set routine, and always put the gear down at a standardized point in the pattern. Make that a rule. We recommend that under normal conditions, you extend the gear by the time you're on downwind, and in any event, be sure to have it down and locked by the time you're abeam the point of intended landing. And always use your before landing checklist. And, just for good measure, add a gump check after you've entered the pattern. That's gas, undercarriage, mixture, and prop. By the way, some people also use the P for fuel pump. And while we're on the subject, we'd like to suggest that you do your last gump check before turning final because after that, you're just too busy. Also, if your usual pattern routine is disrupted, double check to make absolutely sure your gear is down. Or if you feel like you're being rushed to complete your checklist, 
Take it around. Give yourself more time. By the way, a go-around, or balked landing, is the perfect time to forget your gear. More than one pilot has made a go-around, leaving the gear down during the climb-out, then retracting it on downwind with the inevitable result. Shooting touch-and-goes, being distracted by other traffic, being distracted by communications requirements, even sun glaring on landing gear position lights can all contribute to gear-up landings. Notice the red gear unsafe warning light? Can you see it? And then of course there's that right seat passenger who decides after that bumpy ride that your downwind leg is the perfect time to lose his lunch. When something like this happens, you'll want to get that airplane on the ground in the worst way possible. And you probably will. You see, in a situation like this, you might be inclined to forget your checklist and your gear. If you do, of course, you'll end up repeating what 999 other pilots have said before you. You said we were going to be down at 5 o'clock. Other little distractions which simply have to be ignored during pattern entry and landing are things like buzzing insects, yapping spouses, irate pets, and screaming children. When you've put the gear down, always, I repeat, always, check the gear indicator for down and locked as you turn final. Make it a habit to physically touch the gear indicators and say out loud, gear down and locked, or three in the green, or final gear check, three green. Even after you've extended the gear on downwind and have checked it, give it another quick glance on final, but don't fixate on it. Remember, you're about to land an airplane. Now let's talk about extending the gear when you're on the gauges. On an ILS approach, a suggested procedure is to extend the gear as the glide slope is intercepted and your descent begins. For localizer and VOR approaches, the gear should be extended at the final approach fix inbound, the point where you would normally start your descent for landing. Where there is no final approach fix, extend the gear when you roll out of the procedure turn and start your final descent. Remember, however, that these recommendations are predicated on flying a straight-in approach. So, what about circling approaches? Well, here there are two schools of thought. The first school says, put the gear down just as you would on a straight-in approach, that is, when you intercept the glide slope or pass the final approach fix inbound. The second suggests that the gear be extended on the downwind leg abeam the runway if it's in sight. If it's not in sight, or if you see it and then lose it, execute a missed approach. The advantage to this second technique is that if you do end up having to shoot a missed approach, you won't have to worry about retracting your gear. The disadvantage to this technique is that it's a non-standard procedure and you may forget to put the gear down. That's why, once again, Another gear check on short final is always a good habit. What you've really got to do is establish your own gear extension procedures for circling approaches and stick with them. Generally, we feel that the standardized procedure, school number one, is preferred. That is, put your gear down at the same point on all instrument approaches, whether they're straight in or circling. In summary, the key points of our discussion on avoiding gear up landings are use your checklist on every landing and back it up with a gump check. Put the gear down at a standardized point every time. And finally, recheck for three in the green on short final. Now, during the three parts of this program, we've talked a lot about using your pilot's operating handbook. To help drive that point home, and to emphasize the importance of keeping your cool, we offer the following short story. The four of you had had a fine weekend. Everyone, including your spouse, was very impressed with your ability as a pilot. The flight, 
to and from your college homecoming was perfect. And to top it all off, your team even beat State College. Now it's late in the afternoon, and you're only a few miles from home. The four-place retractable you've rented has behaved just like a Swiss watch. Oh, there seemed to be a little sluggishness on gear attraction during that last takeoff, but that didn't bother you much. You felt kind of macho about this whole trip. And although you're the pilot in command, you never used the checklist. As a matter of fact, you never really looked for it. But that was two days ago, and the gum check has worked just fine. And now you're almost home. You switch to the fullest tank, and enrich in the mixture. Everything's going by the book. You call entering downwind on Unicom, then you place the gear handle in the down position, and nothing happens. No sound of the gear system operating, no slight change in pitch as when the gear extends. And most important of all, the three little green lights on the panel haven't come on. Suddenly there's a lump in your throat where the macho used to be. And that great weekend of yours has turned to... The first practical thought that comes to mind is that the problem may be the gear circuit breaker, you hope. So you try to find it, but you can't. Meantime, the airplane has flown well past the point where you normally turn base. You think about stretching the pattern out to give yourself more time. But instead, you remember the advice we gave you in part one of On Landings, that a good pattern begets a good landing. And that distractions while in the pattern can prove fatal. So you make a good decision. You depart the pattern and climb to a higher altitude to buy time to think this problem out. Needless to say, the passengers are quite curious by now about what's going on and begin to ask questions. It's in reassuring the passengers that the airline captain demeanor you've practiced in front of the mirror comes in handy. To say nothing of your imitation Chuck Yeager test pilot voice. You know that your checklist has the emergency extension procedures on it, but in your haste to leave last Friday, you left it down in the rental office, and it's still probably sitting right there. Of course, the POH also has it, and you do know exactly where the POH is. It's sitting back there under a hundred pounds of baggage where nobody can get to it. Don't anybody ask how it got there. Manual gear extension procedures are placarded near the manual gear extension handle. But if you can't read the placard because of dwindling light or for any other reason, there's still one last ditch alternative left to you before you abandon your passengers and bail out. You can still contact the FBO and ask someone for assistance. And if that's what it comes down to, do it. Even if it's embarrassing. Winchester Unicom, uh, Arrow 814 on 123.5, how do you read? Yeah, you're loud and clear, and again, I'm sure we can uh, straighten out this little situation, so tell your passengers not to worry. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, you got some people you're flying with up there. Just make sure they're checking for traffic as long as you're nearby the airport. And before we do the next step, uh, tell me what you uh, And the next item is, is nine times out of ten when you're flying an arrow is going to fix the situation. And that is to make sure that the radio lights and the uh, nav lights are in the off position. So rotate those two knobs uh, to be sure they're in the detent off position. Okay, I did turn the lights on. When you have the panel lights on, the gear lights are dim and you simply can't see them. So you've done that and you still don't have a green light. Uh, next thing I want you to do is uh, reduce the... Uh, again, make sure the normal gear selector is in the down position. Okay, it's in the down position. Okay. Confirm. Now we're going to uh, execute the emergency override system. And that's that little red knob uh, that's uh, between the uh, two front seats behind the, uh, the flat panel. Take a look at that thing. Make sure you've located the proper... Uh, Okay, I got it. Okay, actually all you're going to do at this point is you're going to push down on that thing, just hold it down, and fishtail the 
the airplane, that is, uh, move the rudder pedal left and right a little bit to help the gear free fall. So why don't you give that a try now, and I'm sure that's going to do it. Okay, pull it up. No, no, uh, uh, just push it down and hold it, and the gear, you should hear and feel the gear free fall while you're fishtailing the airplane. Okay, stand by. So, you swallow your pride, call the FBO, get the information read out to you, and lo and behold, you finally get the gear down. Okay, we are three, three in the green, three in the green. Okay, the gear is free fall. Uh, it's locked in the position. Uh, you don't have to worry about collapsing on landing. Uh, but just to be on the safe side, uh, I'm going to go down in the runway here in just a minute with a pair of field glasses. And I'd like you to... Uh, the moral to our little story should be fairly evident. But you know, you could have saved yourself a lot of sweat and embarrassment by having had the checklist NPOH available in the cockpit where they belong. Fortunately, everybody lived happily ever after. Now, before we wrap up landing gear emergencies, let's review some basics. One of the things that's so basic it seldom gets mentioned is finishing your flight with ample fuel reserves. Even when the weather's fine and everything seems to be going well, don't stretch it. An unforeseen gear problem at the end of your flight with minimum fuel reserves can really add stress to an already stressful situation. If you have a gear problem, give yourself time and space to work it out. Leave the pattern and climb to altitude. Then, when you're clear of traffic, review your emergency gear extension checklist before you do anything else. And if necessary, refer to your POH for a detailed system description. Next, slow the airplane down. It's often an essential part of the manual gear extension procedure. Then, before doing anything else, place the gear selector switch or handle in the down position. This is the first step in almost every emergency gear extension procedure. Would you believe that in the excitement of the moment, some pilots have forgotten to do this, and if they were flying an airplane equipped with a one-shot backup system, wasted their one and only chance of getting the gear down at all? And if all else fails, you may have to resort to special flying techniques. One such technique is to slow fly the airplane to reduce aerodynamic loads. Or pull an extra G or two by pulling up to give gravity an extra boost. Whatever procedure you use though, don't outfly your ability. And don't exceed the limitations of your airplane. Spinning in from 4,000 feet is a hell of a lot worse than landing gear up. By the way, if you think that you might be flying in freezing conditions and you take off from a slushy or snow-covered runway, make sure you cycle your landing gear before you climb into the freezing air. It may keep you from having frozen gear that won't extend when you reach your destination. And on that chilling note, we'll leave the subject of gear up emergencies and move on to another type of landing gear emergency landing when you know you have a flat tire. It does happen occasionally, so here's some advice for dealing with it. Some pilot operating handbooks have procedures which you should consult for landing with a flat main tire, which may include burning out fuel on the side with the problem, followed by landing procedures that may include full flaps, control deflections, and some brake usage that are all designed to help you keep the weight on the good tire. If a nose wheel tire is flat, or the nose wheel won't extend, you may want to shift the CG aft, within limits of course, to help hold the nose off during the landing. One way to do this, by the way, is to have the occupants move to the rear seats. Uh, we suggest that uh, you remain in the front seat, however. Also, for some airplanes, trimming full nose down on the rollout may give you more elevator or stabilator surface area to hold the nose off. I'll repeat that. When you have a nose wheel problem, trimming full nose down while holding full up elevator with back pressure may help hold the nose off to a lower speed. Now, how do you know that a tire's flat before you land? 
<laughs> well, you don't, at least not very often. But you should always be alert for unusual sensations, sounds, and feelings. They never happen without a cause. To review, the most important items in the event of a landing gear emergency are take time to think the problem through. Always have a written checklist available. Be cool. And periodically review the emergency procedure section of your POH. icy and snow-covered runways, serious landing hazards which can ruin your whole day. If you have to land on wet, icy or snow-covered runways, here is some very useful information. You may choose to use it and you may not. If you recall, in the segment on landing long in part two, we discussed that for the best combination of aerodynamic drag and wheel braking, the nose wheel should be held off and no brakes applied until the airspeed has decayed to about 75% of the recommended touchdown speed. However, on wet or icy runways, braking effectiveness will be a lot less, maybe even non-existent. In these cases, aerodynamic drag becomes a much more important factor. Take a moment to study this chart. Here you see the braking effectiveness of a particular airplane on dry concrete versus ice. Velocity at touchdown is on the left of the chart and zero velocity or V-stop is on the right. Braking force is on the vertical axis. It's obvious that more braking force can be applied on dry concrete than on ice. Also note, however, that braking forces in both cases increase from nil at V touchdown to a greater value at V stop. Now let's introduce aerodynamic drag. It's the curve that enters at the left and diminishes to zero at V stop. This drag curve is symbolic of a typical airplane and doesn't care what kind of surface the airplane is landing on. Now look at this. As you can see, aerodynamic drag plays a much more important role for a larger portion of the speed decay on an icy runway than it does on dry concrete. So, What's the message? Use aerodynamic drag to your advantage on landing, especially when the runway is wet or icy. To make aerodynamic drag work for you, simply hold your nose wheel off until it settles on its own. But braking isn't the only problem in these conditions. Skidding is another real hazard you face when landing on a wet or icy runway. And improper braking is the perfect way to set yourself up for that skid. Trying to stop the skid by pressing down even harder on the brakes only compounds the problem because whenever you lock the brakes, the wheels stop rolling and braking effectiveness drops to practically nothing. And if the airplane happens to be sliding sideways when it gets to a dry surface, you can easily blow tires or collapse your landing gear, whether the brakes are locked or not. Just as in the case of poor brake pedal pressure, which we discussed in part two, when you're confronted with the prospect of landing on an icy runway, you'll want to be sure that you have as many factors going for you as possible. You want a nice, long runway to roll out on, and you want one that's oriented into the wind. If these conditions don't exist at your destination airport, you should seriously consider diverting to a more suitable alternate. Now, if you're really serious about avoiding an ice-covered runway, then we would recommend... A 
place like this. <laughs> and now back to reality. Taxiing on ice can also be a headache. You may be patting yourself on the back for a super landing on a slick runway, only to find your airplane sliding uncontrollably into a ditch, or suddenly winding up nose to nose with somebody's $10 million biz jet. It's about this time that you start asking yourself, what am I doing here anyway? And perhaps, in retrospect, you would have been better off staying at home, at least until the runways were clean and dry. If you must be out there, taxi very slowly, much slower than you would on bare drive pavement. Of course, if you're taxiing a multi-engine airplane, you can always use differential power to help keep you going in the right direction. And if you're taxiing an airplane with reversible pitch propellers, you can also use them to help you stop. Now, look at this beautiful winter wonderland. Ah, there's nothing like a bright, sunny winter day to sucker you into getting up into the sky from a runway that's been plowed clean and is bone dry, only to come back to land on a sheet of ice. You see, that lucky old sun that had nothing to do but roll around heaven all day was also melting those big snow banks on either side of that runway. Of course, the melted snow runs back across the runway and freezes into glaze sheet ice, especially as the sun goes down. Now, if it had been a nasty old overcast day, you might have expected ice on the runway. But because the weather looked so great and because it's so nice and warm in the cockpit, you tended to forget that it was still winter out there. So don't allow those nice warm rays to lull you into complacency. Winter flying can be icy flying, even when the sun is shining. Snow presents an assortment of landing hazards too. Here are a few of them. It's difficult, if not impossible, to judge the depth of snow on the runway when you're on final. The accident report files are full of stories about runways that appeared to have only an inch or so of the white stuff covering them. When in fact, the snow was so deep it resulted in a winter version of an airplane-shaped hole in the runway. Even when the runway has been plowed, the runway center line and other markings will probably be obscured. As a result, you may find yourself landing short or even drifting off to either side of the runway, especially if crosswinds are present. In addition, as a runway is repeatedly plowed, the snow banks along each side are naturally going to get closer and closer together. And landing without checking can give you that stubby winged fighter you always dreamed of. By the way, Snow, especially blowing snow, can cause a loss of depth perception, also called whiteout. When it happens, it's kind of like landing inside a light bulb. And it's awfully easy to undershoot or even miss entirely when you're trying to land inside a light bulb. In reality, if you do make it to the runway, your chances of staying on the center line are slim. Since breaking on icy or snow-covered runways requires special attention, it's a good idea to plan ahead for it whenever possible. Check your destination runway conditions, including NOTAMs, prior to departure. Check local runway conditions as well, and never expect conditions to remain constant. They may get worse. Which is why you should always make sure you get updated information en route, and always have an alternate handy. If a runway condition report is not available from flight service, go to the nearest phone, pick it up, and call the FBO at your destination. Ask him for runway conditions, breaking reports, and so forth. I don't need to tell you what a $3 phone call can save. Also, try to make sure that someone will be on Unicom when you get there to provide updated information. A word of caution, though. Use discretion when interpreting pilot reports. 
One aircraft may report poor braking conditions, and a few minutes later, another may report good braking. It depends on the aircraft and the pilot, as well as the wind and the weather at the time of the report. And remember, runway conditions might also have gotten worse since the last report. It doesn't take long, you know. Also beware of the macho pilot who would try to tell you that any landing was a piece of cake. And one other point. Some pilots and some FBOs may not volunteer breaking information, even though you might need it desperately. Before we leave the snow and slush associated with cold weather flying, here's an old reminder. Since weather conditions constantly change, and even though you think you might have gotten the best weather briefing known to man, give yourself plenty of fuel reserves. If nothing else, extra fuel will surely help reduce your pucker factor if conditions are marginal. Now, whether it's spring or fall, winter or summer, whatever the time of year, when there's water on the runway, you may be confronted with a problem called dynamic hydroplaning. Dynamic hydroplaning is a condition in which the airplane rides on a sheet or film of water rather than on the runway's surface. Because during hydroplaning, the wheels are not touching the runway, braking and directional control can be reduced to practically nothing. When you're hydroplaning, your airplane is literally surfing on water. To help minimize dynamic hydroplaning, some runways are grooved to help drain off water. But most runways are not, so be careful. Tire pressure is also a factor in dynamic hydroplaning. To understand why, let's take a look at the following formula. With this general formula, you can calculate the minimum speed in knots at which dynamic hydroplaning can begin. You don't have to write it down right now because this formula is also in your handout. Just follow it through with me on the screen. You multiply the square root of your airplane's main tire pressure in pounds per square inch, or PSI, by 9. The result is the minimum speed at which you can expect your particular aircraft to begin hydroplaning. Here's an example. If your tire pressure is 36 pounds per square inch, its square root is 6. So, multiply 6 times 9, and you'll discover that your minimum hydroplaning speed is 54 knots. Landing at higher than recommended airspeeds will expose you to a greater potential for hydroplaning. And let me caution you, once hydroplaning starts, it can continue well below that minimum initial hydroplaning speed. So what's the message? If the runway is wet, be prepared for hydroplaning and opt for the runway most aligned with the wind. Landing into the wind will give you your best chance of maintaining directional control, even though you shouldn't count on it. If you hydroplane, don't make abrupt control movements. Handle the controls like porcupines make love, very carefully. Remember, your brakes are completely useless when you're hydroplaning and should not be used. So, you select the runway most aligned with the wind, touch down flawlessly, use aerodynamic braking to its fullest advantage, and safely clear the runway. You did well. By the way, though, didn't it give you peace of mind to know that everyone on board was wearing their shoulder harnesses throughout that landing, as they should have? In summary, Think about possible braking problems before you land, not afterwards. In this final section of On Landings, we're going to review two more very important subjects. The problems inherent with night landings and those associated with our own decision-making processes. First, for those of us who fly small airplanes, statistics show that landing after dark has an element of risk not present in daylight operations. 
Part of the reason is that we simply don't maintain night flying proficiency. But we also shouldn't kid ourselves. Night VFR can be as tough as flying on instruments. See what I mean? If you haven't done any night flying lately, get together with your flight instructor for a little duel. And in the course of your night landing practice, spend a little time preparing for the unexpected. Shoot some landings without panel lights. And, where permitted, shoot some without landing lights, too. By the way, I'd just like to mention that from time to time throughout this program, we've suggested that you consult with your flight instructor. Well, it's our belief that every pilot should have a flight instructor who's familiar with his or her needs. Remember, Safe flying is a continuing learning experience. At night, a traffic pattern should be flown with extra care. Make sure you have plenty of time for that pre-landing checklist and get as much of it taken care of as you can before entering the pattern. And when you're in the pattern, make sure you maintain and don't exceed your recommended approach speeds. Give yourself plenty of time to set up your landing. We're not talking about a long, low final here either. That's to be avoided at any time, but especially at night. It's actually a good idea to check the airport facility directory or the Canada Flight Supplement for information concerning obstacles near your destination in alternate airports. And check it out before you launch. Then, when you arrive, you can make sure your glide path is high enough to stay well clear whether you see the obstacles or not. Also, make sure that your heading indicator coincides with your magnetic compass. It'll help you get lined up with the correct runway, especially if there's more than one lighted at the time. Many's the time pilots have landed on the wrong runway, especially at night. Also, if you got it, it's a great idea to set the heading bug on your DG or HSI to your runway heading. Setting the bug makes it a lot easier to fly a square pattern, both day and night. And while we're talking about setting things, for heaven's sake, reset your altimeter before you land, even when the weather's clear. The salvage yards are full of wrecks that undershot the runway because their pilots got too low on final and didn't have the depth perception at night to realize it. Remember, a one-inch decrease in barometric pressure means that your altimeter is reading 1,000 feet higher than your actual altitude. And, speaking of 1,000-foot errors, setting your altimeter before you take off is just as important and requires just as much special attention. Double-check all the hands to make sure that you're not off by 1,000 feet. Too many pilots have ignored everything except the 100-foot hand only to crash during descent for landing. Needless to say, if you can get an altimeter setting, for heaven's sake, use it. Zero at one five, gust three zero, altimeter three zero zero five. Mount Vernon approach, news. Even if only as a cross reference. On final, take advantage of a VASI system if available, but never, repeat, never let a low indication appear at night. If you're low, get back up to your glide path immediately or take it around and set it up again. Remember, obstructions such as cables and wires are hard enough to see in the daytime, but they're completely invisible at night. And you can lay odds that any cable impact will be fatal. Besides, the last thing any of us want to do is be responsible for disrupting service from the friendly phone company. If you're landing where there's an ILS and you can use it, use it, even though you may be VFR. Flying in on the localizer will assure you that you're lined up with the assigned runway. And the glide slope indicator can help you stay clear of obstacles, too. Now, if the runway lights become fuzzy on final, be mentally prepared for the possibility of ground fog and suddenly reduced forward visibility just before touchdown. When it happens, even though you may only be a few feet above the runway, an alternate airport is your best bet. Remember, when the temperature and humidity combination is just right, ground fog can form within minutes, obscuring part or all of any runway. Sky 
sky clear, visibility one half, ground fog. Temperature six eight, dew point six six. Wind one eight zero and four, altimeter three zero zero two. Atmospherics can also play games with the intensity and color of lights at night, producing unusual visual cues. And the greater the haze or moisture content in the air, the greater the potential for this phenomena, too. And when atmospherics are not a factor, optical illusions can still cause confusion. For example, one lighted area may be mistaken for another, resulting in pilots sometimes landing at the wrong airport. There have even been cases when airplanes have been landed on roads or in parking lots as a result of this kind of confusion. In an effort to cut costs, many airports have installed radio-activated landing lights. But if you plan to use them, be sure you know how to turn them on. In the United States, the AIM, that's the Airman's Information Manual, and the AIP Canada, that's the Aeronautical Information Publication Canada, each contain information on how these unattended systems work. While the airport facility directory and Canada Flight Supplement both provide the frequencies and procedures needed to activate them. And for Pete's sake, never, repeat, never attempt a landing at an unlighted airport, no matter how well you think you know it. Of course, if you don't have a facility directory or flight supplement with you, and haven't checked the frequencies beforehand, don't be embarrassed about calling flight service for assistance. By the way, these unattended runway lighting systems are usually timed to turn themselves off after about 15 minutes. If you happen to be on short final and the runway suddenly disappears, go around, then reactivate the system by keying the mic on the appropriate frequency. Conversely, when landing at a sophisticated airport, you may be able to ask the tower to raise the runway lights. No, 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 I mean, I mean raise the runway light intensity. The light intensity can be either raised or lowered. You might also want to ask the tower operator to kill the rabbit. Kill the rabbit, you ask? Yes, but the rabbit I'm talking about is the series of fast-moving strobe lights which are part of the approach lighting system. The tower controls them, too. You see, even though these lights have served the useful purpose of leading you to the runway threshold, when you get on short final, atmospherics can sometimes make them distracting, even blinding. By the way, you should be familiar with the approach and obstruction lighting systems in use at your destination. And remember, blue lights outline taxiways. You'll lose points if you land between the blue lights. A tip. Seeing obstacles at night is difficult at best. One way to make it a little easier for you to see outside is to dim your cockpit and instrument panel lights inside. Most obstructions around airports are marked with either red lights or white strobe lights. Keep an eye peeled for them. And before we leave the subject of lighting completely, let's talk for a minute about backup cockpit lighting. What I'm talking about, of course, are flashlights. If you're caught dead without one, it's pilot error. In fact, you should carry a couple. And an old naval aviator's trick is to have a cord on at least one of them to hang around your neck. You see, flashlights are awfully easy to lose and awfully hard to find. And make sure the cord is long enough to let the light rest comfortably in your lap. That way you'll always have enough slack to use it freely. Your flashlight should have fresh batteries, a bulb, and they should work. Experienced pilots also carry spare batteries and bulbs in their flight bags. Do you? Carrying a flashlight can be a real lifesaver. Frankly, if your panel lights fail, it's going to be awful hard to fly a good approach with anything else. And if you plan to fly at night, carry extra glasses. Oh, come on, man, I'm talking about spectacles here. Carry an extra pair of spectacles if you're required to wear them while flying. 
and if you wear contacts, back them up with a pair of glasses. That way, if you lose one contact, you take the other one out and go to your backup system. Not being able to see well is bad enough in day VFR conditions, but at night, it could prove fatal. By the way, one of the ways old flyers get to be old flyers is that before they land at night at airports where there is little or no activity, they overfly the runway at 50 to 100 feet AGL with their landing lights on. They simply want to make sure that nothing is on the runway that doesn't belong there. You see, a runway can hold the sun's heat for up to four hours after nightfall. And because it radiates warmth, it becomes a favorite stopping place for deer and other nocturnal creatures. It also happens to be a great place for clandestine drag racing. And even serves as a parking spot for young lovers. Of course, you'll never find old lovers there. They can afford to go elsewhere. And on that note, I think we've just about wrapped it up. It seems like we've covered just about every conceivable kind of landing phase accident, doesn't it? And I guess we have. But there's one vital element that we have deliberately sidestepped until now because it's so crucial to all flight operations, including landings. And that's, of course, the human element. You, the pilot. You see, when it comes right down to it, most accidents, including most landing phase accidents, are the result of a failure in the human element, or more specifically, a failure in our decision-making process. Most accidents go down in the record books as having been caused by pilot error. Yet, pilot error really refers to a whole gamut of things, like stress overload, or being on a mental holiday, or pushing yourself beyond reasonable limits. In other words, falsifying risk through rationalization. Facts show that some of the worst examples of pilot error accidents occur when you're flying at night. It could be that you're so hungry you can hear your stomach growl over the sound of the engine, or that you're so tired that your eyes burn and your muscles ache. Either way, you're looking at two examples of the kind of stress that can sway your decision-making process. Or you may fall victim to get there a compelling motivation to get you to your destination at any cost. When that happens, your thought processes begin to blur and you tend to rationalize your go, no-go decision to your advantage. As a result, operations that normally would have appeared to be risky to unthinkable gradually seem to become quite reasonable. And that really puts you in double jeopardy because the landing is not only the most demanding of all flying tasks, but it also comes at the end of the flight when you're the most tired. A tragic example of what we're talking about happened when a pilot who was fixated by get there itis made five downwind passes at an unlighted runway toward the headlights of a friend's car. On the sixth pass, he struck power lines and killed everyone on board. We don't know exactly why the pilot felt compelled to land at night at that unlighted airport, and we never will. But we do know that we can learn from his mistakes and from the mistakes of others. You see, landing phase accidents account for roughly half of all the flying accidents every year. And the ironic thing is that they're always the same kinds of accidents year in and year out. So what say we do something about them together, okay? Review those basics. Get that knowledge. Sharpen your flying skills. Shoot some landings. Bring your proficiency up to snuff and keep it there. But above all, recognize that you, as pilot in command, are the weakest link in the total man-machine system especially when you're under stress. So, fly relaxed. It'll help reduce stress and allow you to make better, more balanced, more rational decisions. Years before the Wright brothers first flew, 
an anonymous poet wrote four lines that should be a pilot's creed. If a task is once begun, never leave it till it's done. Be the labor great or small, do it well or not at all. This program has been made possible by the Textron Lycoming Williamsport Division, the FAA, Transport Canada, and the General Aviation Manufacturers Association, in the hope that each and every one of you will have many happy landings.